So T-Rex is known as Dinosaur King, which is fair considering it was the biggest predator of North America during the late Cretaceous. But as Yoda put it, there is another. Namely a dinosaur that had this crown during the early Cretaceous. In 1947, Juan Lanson Jr. found some therapy material that he studied for his master's thesis. This material was found within the Antlers Formation in Oklahoma, and both he and J. Willis Stovall realised this was unlike any other known, and elected to then formally describe this as a new dinosaur in 1950, Acrocanthosaurus atakensis. Now as more material has been found over the decades, we've soon come to realise that this was amongst the largest theropods to have ever existed. Acrocanthosaurus was a type of allosaurid that grew to be around 11.5 meters or 38 feet long and somewhere between 4.4 and 6.6 tons, making it only two feet shorter than the famous T-Rex. Now the skull itself was a lot more akin to other allosauroids, being much longer and more narrow, with a higher nasal bone complete with a low ridge similar to those of Gigantosaurus. Moving down to the gnashes, we see it had sharp serrated teeth that whilst ideal for meat slicing, were a little wider than typical, giving possible clues into how it ate, which I'll get into soon enough. Moving along, we see the prominent features of this dinosaur. Along the back, the neural spines of this guy were excessively high, giving it its namesake, high-spined lizard. His neural spines were pretty uniform from neck to tail, creating a ridge all along the animal. But was this a half assed Spinosaurus? Well, probably not. The actual function remains unknown, however this didn't form an actual sail along the back. The lower portions of the spines had muscle attachments with the upper portion likely being used for fat storage, making the spines convergently similar to the humps of bison. The other distinguishing feature, if we look down, is the legs. Now theropods are famously leggy, with really big, powerful hind limbs and highly reduced forelimbs, but Acrocanthosaurus was slightly different. This guy actually had relatively short legs for its size. They were a lot more robust than other allosaurus to support that size, but the relative shortness would have appeared even more exaggerated in life since the body appeared so tall thanks to the neural spines. This length, as well as the relative length of the femur compared to the tibia, meant that for all its strengths, running was most certainly not one of them. But perhaps it didn't need to. Again, more on that in a sec. Overall, this wasn't just a larger theropod. This guy was the second biggest theropod dinosaur behind T-Rex ever found in North America and unlike any other. Now, Acrocanthosaurus material has been found namely in the aforementioned Antlers, Twin Mountains, Cloverly, and Arundel formations, meaning it was widespread across all of North America before it was completely cut in half by the Western Interior Seaway, living there between 125 and 100 million years ago. These areas were largely fluvial floodplains, along with subtropical forests and the odd swamp dotted around, being comparable to today's Louisiana. Living here you had small generalist mammals, some freshwater fish and reptiles, and a wide range of dinosaurs, including Aquilops, Sauropelta, Astrodon, the massive Sauroposeidon, the famous Deinonychus, which I do talk more about here, Microvenator, and Tenontosaurus. So with all of this known, what did they like for dinner? Prey items for Acrocampsaurus have been a hotly debated topic for some time now. Like any large predator, it certainly wouldn't have turned its nose up at most of the animals that crossed its path, or even scavenging remains if they presented themselves easily enough. But such a large animal with such distinguishing features is often that way for a reason, most of the time related to prey. So a quick reminder of the anatomy. The head was large, the forelimbs were small but clawed and formidable, being particularly good at grasping and pulling towards the body. The legs were short, stout and robust, powerful but not fast, and those neural spines created a hump of muscle and fat, likely larger muscles than other theropods with smaller neural spines. Many of the muscles along the spinal column of a theropod are associated with manipulating something held within the jaws, thrashing it around or holding it sternly in place. When these were so big with Acrocanthosaurus, with the legs being short and stout enough to ground the animal well, and the forelimbs being so good at pulling, paleontologists have put forward the idea that Acrocanthosaurus was a wrestler. Standing its ground well with those legs, it could bite down on its prey of choice with enough confidence that it could hold or even wrench that prey down, 
using those forelimbs to grip and help with this. But if Acrocanthosaurus was so big and slow, surely its prey couldn't have been small and quick, right? In that case, speed is going to be a lot more beneficial than just raw strength. Unless their prey items are equally as big and slow. Any guesses? A popular proposed idea is that Acrocanthosaurus was one of the very, very few theropods that had the cojones to take on a sauropod. The two main sauropods in question were Astrodon, a titanosaur that grew up to 20 metres or 66 feet in length, weighing around 20 tonnes, and Sauroposidon, a Brachiosaurus relative with length estimates of 27 to 30 metres or 89 to 112 feet long, and between 40 and 60 tonnes in weight. Big ass animals, basically. Taking these down would require inordinate amounts of strength of which Acrocanthosaurus was likely capable, but even so, it couldn't do it alone. One trackway found in Texas, known as the Glen Rose Trackway, actually shows what is likely to be several tracks of Acrocanthosaurus footprints, pursuing up to 12 large sauropods. Now, obviously, this has been met with some doubt since we can't actually know for sure whether these prints were made simultaneously, but the patterns have been interpreted as such. But, like with many prehistoric animals, the answer is far from obvious. So what do you guys think? What was the deal with these neural spines? And what is the reason that Acrocanthosaurus was potentially an absolute powerhouse? Was it for taking out sauropods? As always, I love discussing this with you guys, so be sure to leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. And also leave a subscribe and a like if you haven't already. And I will catch you guys next time.